Okay, so I wanted to talk to you today about the biggest environmental project imaginable. So what, what if, you know, think about for a second, you know, what might that be? Well, what if you could prevent the biggest disaster imaginable? That might be the biggest environmental project imaginable, right? Well, um, we've had some really bad disasters lately, earthquakes, tsunamis, you know, there was a, some bad hurricanes lately. Well, I think you can actually make the case that the biggest disaster possible isn't actually on the Earth right now, but it's actually something hitting the Earth. I mean, you've all heard how the, the dinosaurs died, right? We were hit by an asteroid, right? But did you realize that the, the rock that hit the Earth that killed off nearly everything on Earth was only about 10 kilometers across? It's a pebble compared to the size of the Earth. How could something so small wipe out everything on Earth nearly? I mean, I grew up in a little town in upstate New York, and it's larger than, it's a town called Webster, New York, and it's larger than 10 kilometers. So if my little town hit the Earth, how could that wipe out everything? Well, it turns out we actually have a pretty good answer to that, and it's, in cap it's encapsulated in the rocks. I've got here a little rock. Um, and it's a rock like any other rock worldwide you can go. This one happens to be from Colorado. If you dig down to the right layer, you can find the layer that, that was put down on the day when all the, or when all the dinosaurs died. You can go to India, South America, Africa, Europe, wherever you want. You dig down to what's called the KT boundary, and you will find a rock that looks like this, and it has a little layer like that in it. It's a dark layer. And it's a layer of ash. And that meant that the entire world was covered in ash at one point. Well, how did that happen? Okay, let's picture yourself as a dinosaur. You're minding your own business. You're on the other side of the world from the Yucatan Peninsula where all this happened to begin with. I mean, if you happen to be a dinosaur minding your own business and you're maybe only a couple thousand miles away, say, somewhere in North America, something like that, you died instantly from the flash of this thing. But what if you're 12,000 miles away on the other side of the Earth? Well, you wouldn't have noticed anything to begin with. But there's a crater about 180 kilometers across, and if you calculate the volume of that crater and ask what happened, well, about a hundred, couple hundred thousand cubic miles of molten rock got thrown out of that crater, and it went up into space. And where does it all then come? It comes back down to Earth, bit by bit, and tiny little shooting stars. So here you are, eating your, your trees or vegetables or whatever it is you're eating on the other side of the Earth. What you would have noticed if you looked up, um, and now this is over the next couple hours, shooting stars starting to come down. First a few, and then a lot, and then more and more and more. And they're just shooting stars, that's all they are. They're not things that are running down into the ground, they're just beginning to heat the upper atmosphere. Well, if you calculate how much a couple hundred thousand cubic miles of rock re-entering the upper atmosphere heats the upper atmosphere too, the answer is that the, over the next couple hours, the upper atmosphere heats to about 500 degrees. That's a broiler oven. So has anybody here ever left a piece of toast in a toaster oven for more than a minute or two? Or a piece of pizza in a broiler oven for a couple of minutes? What happens? Bursts into flames, right? Well, if the Earth is one giant broiler oven, and we're talking everywhere on Earth now, for a few hours, what happens to everything? A giant worldwide firestorm started. Every tree, every grassland, every forest, it all burned that day. It was a really bad day. And <laughs> what that meant is that, you know, if you look at this fossil, if you go anywhere, you will find fossils of dinosaurs below this and none above it. What this was was a giant control alt delete, right? <laughs> and you know, admittedly, this is a pretty rare occurrence. This has only happened on Earth between 50 and 100 times. It's pretty rare, right? 50 to 100 times we've been control alt deleted. Gets you thinking, right? Well, now, it turns out that, again, those are pretty rare. So there are many more smaller asteroids than these big 10 kilometer ones. How about a one kilometer asteroid? Those, those are much more numerous. Um, one kilometer is about this. If you walk about 10 blocks outside here, that's about the size. It's not that big. One of those hitting the Earth. Well, that wouldn't necessarily cause this global firestorm. It wouldn't wipe everything out that way. But it would throw up enough dust to cause, that, cause us to have no growing seasons on Earth worldwide for a few years. I'll give you something to think about. If that happened today, Earth has only a couple of months of food supply on the entire Earth right now. That's what we humans have stockpiled. What would happen to human civilization if we had, were not able to grow anything for several years? I think civilization as we know it would not exist. You know, I don't know exactly what would happen, but it's not a world I would want to live in. So let's talk, that kind of thing has only happened on Earth around 5,000 times. 
Oh, so those actually happen fairly frequently, right? Well, how about even smaller? Something the size of a football stadium. Something like that, if it hit in the water, would create a tidal wave a few times larger than itself. So let's say, call it 200 meters, you're talking about a half a kilometer high wave. We just saw a tsunami in Japan, right? Caused a lot of damage, right? Anybody know how big that tsunami was? It was like three to four meters, okay? Put a half a kilometer wave in the ocean and ask what happens to all the cities around that ocean. Okay, those happen. In your lifetime, there's about a 1% chance that you'll witness that in your lifetime. Anybody here have house insurance on their house? You know, fire insurance in your house? You have less than a 1% chance of your house burning down in your lifetime, but you carry fire insurance on your house. Okay, let's talk even smaller. Something roughly the size of this room, 40 meters across. The last one of those to hit was in Tunguska in Siberia. That, uh, when that hit, it wiped out an area about the size of from San Francisco down to San Jose, from the Golden Gate Bridge to San Jose. That's about 100 times larger in area than the area devastation of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. And there's about a 50% chance in your lifetime that you'll see another one of those, somewhere's on Earth. Hopefully it'll be over the water, but you know, these odds aren't that small. But here's the amazing thing I want to tell you about, is that we can actually do something about it. You know, we are, in some sense, the beneficiaries of the, of the dinosaurs being wiped out, because we managed to take over many, many years later, right? But we've actually been developed, we've been hard at work developing some interesting technologies, rockets, telescopes, calculus, understanding gravity, and so on. And those turn out to be the ingredients that you need to solve this problem. So how would you go about uh, preventing this? Well, it turns out that the, no, the first step is something you, that, that makes complete sense, which is if you don't know something's coming, there's nothing you can do about it, right? If you don't know where these are, it, you, you, there's nothing you can do, right? You have to find them. And not only do you have to find them, you have to be able to measure their course accurate enough to know if it's going to hit, right? So um, it's not just that, though. It turns out that if I give you an early warning that you're going to be hit by this asteroid, and it's very, very late. There's not much you can do. Picture somebody, let's say the people in the front row here, and I'm going to throw a baseball at you right at your head right now. Okay? Is there much you can do about that? Not really. What if I was standing a mile and away and I had really good aim and I was throwing something at you? Even a tiny little gust of wind would keep that thing from hitting you, right? You must find them early. So that the mantra of asteroid deflection is, is coined by my friend Don Yeomans, find them early, find them early, find them early. So how do you find them early? Well, let me show you a little video. It shows the situation. Um, it is actual data. It's from the folks at Armagh Observatory. It's looking down on our solar system. The third planet out, that's the sun in the middle, the third one out, watch that. That's the Earth. You see all those asteroids going by? This is, these are all the known asteroids. Okay, There's about 8,000 of them there. Here's the interesting thing. The first interesting thing about this is we're flying around the solar system in a shooting gallery. B, look how many of those are going past the Earth. And the other thing is that um, that's less than 1% of, no of the asteroids that we know to exist. Okay, so there's a lot more of them out there than that. Okay, but think about this. If you're sitting on the Earth, and these were discovered from telescopes on the Earth, how hard is it to find those on the other side of the sun? It's pretty hard, right? It's a telescope. You don't look at the sun when you're trying to spot things out in space, right? Where do you really want to be to spot these things? You want to be somewhere interior to the Earth, say kind of where near Venus is, but looking out. So you have the opportunity to find things that are on the other side of the sun. So be orbiting the sun from that vantage point. And it turns out that if you were to do that, and it turns out the right way to do that is in infrared because uh, asteroids are, turn out to be, stand out very bright in infrared. So what it requires is, a, is an infrared space telescope orbiting the sun somewhere interior to the Earth. It turns out if you do that, then you will actually get many decades of notice. Not just years, not just months, decades. So all these crazy movies you see in Hollywood about people deflecting things with months, that's really not the right idea, believe it or not. Hollywood's not accurate. But um, <laughs> if you get decades, you actually have lots of options. These asteroids are out there, just like the Earth, they go around the sun perhaps about 60 to 100,000 miles an hour. Okay. Um, if you change that velocity to 60,000 miles an hour plus about this speed, a few tenths of a centimeter per second, see I'm moving my hand, that's enough to turn an impact into a miss. That's all it really takes. So it is something that's feasible. So the key is, again, 
get early warning, and we can do something about it. It turns out that all you really need to do to change a moderate side asteroid, say a, a, a football stadium, to change its speed by that much is to actually run a small spacecraft into it. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to have space telescopes. We know how to build space telescopes, right? We built the Hubble, we built the Kepler Space Telescope. We can do that, right? How about precision guidance so that we can run something into an asteroid? Precision tracking. We know how to do that, right? We've actually run uh, a spacecraft into an asteroid, or into a comet, actually. It's called, a mission called Deep Impact. And we've even done this. NASA and the European Space Agency landed a probe on the shore of a lake of a satellite of the planet Saturn. Think about that, right? We can do this. This is something that we as humans, NASA in particular, has figured out how to do. Okay? So where does this leave us? It leaves us with a, with a choice. I mean, we can be playing cosmic roulette, right? The, the odds are what they are, and they eventually catch up to you, right? I mean, it's happened before, it will happen again. So if you are you know, playing the odds, the house always wins, right? And I'll give you a, I'll let you in on a secret, you know, we're not the house in this, okay? <laughs> so, you know, we have actually priced this out. Our foundation, the B612 Foundation, has actually looked with the experts at how much it would actually cost to build the observatory that gives us advance warning so that we can stop this threat. It turns out to be a few hundred million dollars. That's expensive, right? But let's put that into perspective. That's about the cost of a municipal civic project, building a museum, performing arts center, a road widening project in a major street. That's the kind of scale that we're talking about that can protect humanity from this point forward. So all of those projects tend to have been built before those museums and so on, by small groups of dedicated individuals. And that's actually the scale that we're talking about. So this is actually rather amazing. A small group of dedicated individuals could actually change the course of human history and protect humanity from this long-term threat. And I can tell you that if we don't solve this problem someday, the odds are eventually going to catch up to us. But I think we can. So I think the, the time is now. We've got the ability. We have we have uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of human evolution that have led to the development of rocketry and telescopes, and we should go use them. And I think the time is now, so let's go do it.